Well, greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Maura Stevens, and I'm welcoming you on behalf of System Change, Not Climate Change. We are so thrilled to bring you this offering in our webinar series, Art versus Capitalism, with one of our favorite artists, Stephanie McMillan, who's brought us so many joyous, furious, whimsical, and passionate creations over the years. First, let's take a personal moment to silently acknowledge the peoples whose lands and histories each of us inhabits today, and to send an astral knot of acknowledgement, love, and concern to those who will call us ancestors. System Change Not Climate Change is an eco-socialist, anti-capitalist network. We invite you to learn more about us, visit our very robust website and social media sites and watch the videos on our YouTube channel, including this one, which will be up in a day or two. If you find our points of unity speak to you, please join us. There's power in numbers and joy in solidarity. We'll post those links in the chat or that's below if you're watching on YouTube later. Now I'd like to welcome our guest moderator, Edia, Edie Pistolesi, who will introduce Stephanie and lead the conversation in Q&A. Edie Hi. Hi. is an eco-socialist art and art education pro professor emerita, whose own work has included anti-capitalist art and performance art installations. Over to you, Edie. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon. I guess it's morning. Welcome to Art Against Capitalism with Stephanie McMillan. Stephanie McMillan is an award-winning and widely published cartoonist, producing editorial cartoons, comic strips, children's books, and graphic novels. She is currently painting and drawing plants and wildlife in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where she is a third generation resident. Her artwork has always been about reaching third, or reaching towards social transformation and overcoming capitalism and imperialism. Now, Stephanie captures the evils of capitalism better than anybody. She does have a way with humor. And in her political cartoons, you can seethe with rage at the capitalists and also get a good laugh. As an extra bonus today, one of her paintings that is not in this slideshow is over my left shoulder. The message on the gigantic coffee mug says, warning, may contain products of imperialist aggression. So be forewarned. And before I, we get to Stephanie, let me say just one more thing again. If you see one of her art pieces and it sort of touches you and grabs you or anything, you want to talk about it, tell us about it in the chat. Okay. All right. Now it's time for you, Stephanie. Well, thank you, Edie. Um, I really appreciate being invited to, um, to be here today. Thank you to the group System Change, Not Climate Change, and especially Edie and David, the members who I've known the longest um, for 10 years now. So I really appreciate this chance to present my work and their invitation. Um, I'm gonna share a slideshow and that it's kind of a generally chronological, but also grouped by some um, themes and mediums. So it's not exactly chronological, but uh, I hope it'll be a good um, expression of some of the highlights of things that I've been doing. So um, bear with me while I bring that up. So um, this kind of expresses the two main themes that I have mostly been working with, love the living, fight the machine. Most of it's been fight the machine actually. Um, more lately, I've been turning toward the other aspect of things, love the living, which you'll see as uh, we move along. This was my very first political public art. It was in 1983 in the Reagan era and there was a lot of threats uh, toward world war, a lot of fears that we all had. And um, this was me in high school 
so that was also my first protest that I ever went to. <laughs> um, and ever since then, art and political action have really been intertwined for me. Um, in fact, I was persuaded not long after this to set art aside for a while um, and just focus on political action because it did seem so urgent. It was so urgent. And I was persuaded that um, that, that was more important than pursuing art. So I actually didn't pursue art for a while after this, um, though it always kind of came out in the political work too, like um, you'll see illustrating flyers and so on. This was my first editorial cartoon and it's very wordy and messy. I don't, it's not the first one, but it's um, in the first few years. Uh, I worked at a small weekly paper where they invited me to do editorial cartoons. And my first attempts were very wordy, very messy, but gradually um, they became a little better. Uh, I was actually asked to stop um, running, told to stop running cartoons in that paper because one of my coworkers found it to be, he thought that um, when I was, I criticized um, religious control over women's healthcare and he found that to constitute an a uh, hostile work environment. So they fired me as a cartoonist. Um, but then I started syndicating them to different newspapers. This is an example of one of those. I gave it a new name, Minimum Security. Started out as a single panel drawing. Um, and I also, later on, this is around 2009 to 2012, I did a comic called, an editorial cartoon called Code Green that focused on environmental emergency. Look at that devastation, son. There's almost nothing left of the natural world. I'm counting on you to squeeze the last scraps of profit out of it. The Secretary of the Interior noted that the American that American children spend a daily average of only four minutes outside. Outside what? And this one ended up being my favorite of all of those. I'll just leave it on for a minute. And I think it epitomizes the system's approach to nature. I also, um, minimum security evolved into a multi-panel strip that became syndicated later uh, with the regular characters. And then toward the end of the, the run of that, I did that for, I think around eight years or so, um, it became a story that turned into a graphic novel. And it was about a group of friends who tried a bunch of different ways to stop ecocide, um, each one failing actually. So it doesn't really have a happy ending, um, but that's this graphic novel here, Resistance to Ecocide. But it does, I think it, they have a lot of interesting debates within it that I think is, are still useful perhaps to go over. Um, when Occupy happened, uh, I really found the need to start understanding more deeply and also sharing that learning with about how capitalism actually works. So I created with the help of some comrades, I was working with a group at the time called One Struggle and we had an anti-capitalist caucus. This is at Occupy Miami, um, a slideshow that we developed, that I developed and uh, trying to point to capitalism as the root of all the problems that people were protesting about, which I think since then, now I think people really understand that, but at the time it wasn't really very widely um, understood to be the, you know, the glue that holds all these problems together and keeps them going. And that became a book called Capitalism Must Die. And in that book, I used cartoons to try to um, convey different concepts that related to what capitalism is and how to fight it, uh, such as surplus value, which I think is an important concept to understand, <clears throat> imperialism, and class revolution. Also, talk, it talks about uh, different ways that we can be trapped into uh, capitalist agendas, even while we feel that we're protesting them. 
Here's one about internationalism and bourgeois politics. And I also did a graphic novel called The Beginning of the American Fall that sort of chronicled my actual experiences with the Occupy protests. Here's one in Fort Lauderdale. So um, this was a project of the group that I worked with at the time, One Struggle. It's a rapid response network where we took um, leadership from workers who we had connections with. When they had struggles, they would let us know how they wanted um, people to respond and give solidarity. So um, I wanted to bring out the fact that my artwork has always been kind of connected to this sort of activism and how the activism really, I think, made it made the artwork a lot richer because it wasn't just being observed from outside, but came from real experiences. So here's a graphic I did for a flyer. Walmart is working very hard to bring its customers low prices. And this was part of a countdown toward a minimum wage decision in Haiti that um, some workers we knew were asking us to sort of amplify and um, bring attention to. So it would um, bring some more international weight to the decision that the government was making at the time. Um, Haynes was one of the brands that contracted with some of the factories where um, the comrades were unionizing and some of them were fired for doing so. So we had uh, a campaign here in the US around that and it included flyering around this Hanes store that we did in South Florida. Um, we also had, cult we had cultural events and thought of culture as a way to bring people together and make connections um, among people of different nationalities about talking about how imperialism has affected them personally and their cultures and nations and um, trying to build from that uh, political movement. And it, it was pretty, and it was amazing for a little while. Um, we had a protest here um, after the factory fire in Bangladesh in 2012 and um, sent the picture to people we knew in Bangladesh who then brought it to the group of workers that we were communicating with um, so they could see that uh, there was some solidarity here around what they were going through. At, the, at that time, I did a calendar called 365 Daily Affirmations for Revolutionary Proletarian Militants. And it, all, it brought out like affirmations that were directly related to things that we were dealing with as activists. Um, and it's still available today from Burning Books. We had a preprint. Um, as a joint project. So they have them over there. My comrades span the globe of, the globe and all of history. Whether I know them by name or not, we're in this fight together. I don't blame myself for the goals I don't achieve because of capitalism trapping us in constant survival mode. So it kind of addressed some psychological issues as well. Um, I wanted to put this in here because David, the um, system change, not climate change member, and I did this book together and um, that was a really great experience. And I think it turned out really well. And here are some illustrations also um, that talk about, that relate to just the angst and um, anger around climate change and capitalists um, being responsible for that, as well as more affirmative um, and optimistic kinds of illustrations that talk about how I feel at least that uh, we can build strength against what's happening. Uh, some of them I made into coloring pages and shared those. Uh, they're still available for free on my website. 
Um, I got into painting after, oh, I forgot to mention that um, when newspapers collapsed, I gradually lost all my freelance cartooning gigs. So I turned to more painting. Uh, this, these are some that were kind of very motivated by anger and frustration about the system and the need to resist. Climate change, of course, this one, I feel this way now. Here's capitalism eating the planet. This one is about the exploitation of labor and of the natural world together, which I think they're very intertwined. This one I'm including because Edie, um, um, she suggested it and I'm happy that she likes it so much. It's called Capitalism's Last Supper. This one, um, Another diagram, I love diagrams. So I made a painting of a diagram trying to work out the flow of capital from resource extraction all the way through the retail experience. And also uh, a lot of my work is about solidarity and resisting together and um, being strong as we grow in numbers. This was a, these are the rules that um, a group of Amazon workers, Amazon warehouse workers in Chicago had posted a few years ago in their Facebook group. And I had gotten to know a couple of them on Facebook and I asked them permission if I could paint their rules. And they said, sure. So I did that and I sold the painting and donated, donated the money to their organizing effort and then sent some prints to them. So that was, I really like when I can make my art in some way concretely supportive of people struggling for, especially in the labor movement, because I think the root of the main force of getting rid of capitalism has to be in the working class. I also did some illustrations that people can use for posters. So around like May Day and International Working Women's Day. and around specific issues. This um, was during COVID, uh, the earlier days when it, well, it still does, but it just, you know, so many of us felt it as a very heavy and huge weight and didn't know how we were going to get out from under it, if we ever will. Um, and that this is making the point, of course, that it'll take solidarity and mutual aid to feel any relief from something like that. Oops, this was my response to the war starting in Ukraine. So during that time of um, more isolation, I started having, wondering like what, what could I actually do to help um, the situation and does art really make a difference? And it felt a little bit confusing and um, emotionally difficult. So I was searching and I found on Facebook, this woman I had been following, um, Betty Osceola, a Miccosukee grandmother was leading a virtual prayer, pr virtual prayer walk 
and it was over the course of several weeks and um, I decided to do it. So I would walk around my neighborhood and she had certain things that she would want us to tell ourselves and to ask of the world around us. And so I started asking the plants and wildlife, you know, and I live in a city, so wildlife is not that prevalent, but they're still here. You know, there are a lot of insects, there's there are ducks and iguanas and spiders and, you know, squirrels, a lot of wildlife still lives here. And I was asking, you know, what, is there anything I can, I don't really belong here. Like I'm the descendant of settlers and an immigrant and I don't really have the connection to the land that I should. And I don't really know how I can be in a reciprocal relationship with it. Um, aside from, you know, gardening, which I do, but it just didn't seem like enough. And also I just wanted to know you know, is there a reason for me to be here and to do artwork? And so here's what the wildlife and plants told me. You don't have a right to be here. You have a responsibility to be here. Bring your spirituality down to earth right here. See who's in front of you. And I didn't used to be at all a spiritual person, but I think that's sort of opening up a lot in me in the last few years. Come back and take your rightful place in this world with us. Tiny manifestations emerge and combine into the whole paradigm shifts. And that to me says that each little thing that we do are small strands of activity or thoughts, um, how we behave, it really does make a difference. And there's no real such thing as a small act. So I decided to take the take leadership from the land and its inhabitants and follow my intuition, which I feel like is the their voice, the voice of the collective consciousness of the world. So that's how I more approach things now. And what they told me they wanted was, well, they said the people who live here are mostly from out of town. They mostly are tourists or people who moved here recently. They haven't lived here. They don't know the names of the plants and animals. They don't even notice them. So we want you to introduce us and say hello and ask people to know our names and who's around here. So I started doing that with this project where I put prints around town for people to find and I posted on Instagram. Um, so people can go and look for them. And it's gone really well so far. I've been doing that since around um, almost a year now, actually. So I also focus as much as I, I focus a lot on the ones that I feel are underappreciated. Like the, the plant that was just in the last one is considered um, a horrible weed that everybody tries to eradicate and they spray for it and stuff, but it's actually a very important native wildflower that provides one third of the food to bees around here. So here's one in a Home Depot that I left. And I also have started using them as a way to show locations where people don't ordinarily notice either. So this one's next to um, our county jail. And this one's in a butterfly garden. So trying to show like the space is also important. This one is next to a tree that has been the subject of a lot of controversy um, in town because a developer pulled it out of the ground to build a luxury apartment building. And this tree is over 100 years old and wasn't looking too good. And um, people were getting really upset. So I put one there and I also worked with some friends and neighbors to um, hold a little protest next to the tree um, where we wrote messages on those red cards and put them on the fence. These um, next few are ones that I've done pretty recently. Uh, 
that are exploring um, the connection between humans and the rest of the world and among all the different species of plants and wildlife. So just trying to find through art a way to visualize how to connect and the fact that we are all connected and we are all really one substance. And I try to draw the species right around here, um, focus on them mostly. So this was um, a little bit earlier and it also expresses the intertwined emotions that I feel when I make art, which is rage against capitalism, imperialism, love for the people and planet, actually the emotions I feel all the time. Um, and I try, to, I try to find ways to express all that in each drawing, but often it's sort of more first one than the other. So these are recent sketches, protect the web of life, collective ownership of the means of production, love holds the world together, degrading wealth, hungers for investment opportunities, love is all around, the voracious real estate industry will eat us all, we are not resources. And this is how it feels in our city sometimes. Building after building being put up. I'm sure that's happening in a lot of places. I know it is. Land back and workers unite. These are kind of the two intertwined um, activities that I feel are crucial and the backbone of uh, transforming our society to one that's healthy and sustainable. This one I'm including at Edie's suggestion also because I think it does express both of those things. It says, as the moon rises over the Everglades, critters roast marshmallows over a fire while flamingos inform a fracking executive that his presence is unwelcome. It expresses the rage and the love, I think. And here's one showing us casting off the society that's destroying us, the social practices, and hopefully being able to transform and emerge a world where we can all thrive. And that's the end of my slideshow. So I'm gonna go back to everybody being on the screen. And thanks for looking. Well, let's see, we have um, great work, thanks. And um, beautiful, love the art, gotta go, that well, at least. <laughs> um, there was one thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, in, your, in your drawings and paintings where you're, you've got all kinds of, of creatures and flowers and they all have expressions there's always a little tiny bug and you always hide it. it's always there and I have to look for it every time it's usually bottom right down almost and one was actually off the picture and on the frame but there's this <laughs> tiny 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 little bug and it's looking at us and it's smiling either that or it's smirking and it's got tiny little wings maybe and I always love that you you never forget anybody. They're there, even the tiny I, little creatures. Thanks for noticing that. I do feel like they're incomplete without those little bugs sometimes. They're, they're just uh, inviting us to notice them, I think, in life. It's true. Um, somebody else said gorgeous colors. 
Oh, thanks. Oh, and somebody else said, who is that bug? <laughs> well, can you answer that question? It's um, a different one every time. There's no specific bug that it is. I shouldn't even use the word it. I'm sorry, that they are, because it is a, um, using the word it is objectifying, and I, they shouldn't be objectified. So sorry for that. Oh, uh, somebody said, amazing work. Oh, that's kind. <laughs> Thanks. So, and somebody else loves the hand lettering throughout. Yes, you're, yes, that's definitely true. Beautiful. Thanks, it got a little bit less messy since, since the beginning. I was actually criticized that the, in the beginning of my cartooning that my lettering was very horrible, but it, I think it's gotten somewhat better. <laughs> and another person says gorgeous cartoons, very moving. Thank you. And somebody said, oh, it's more, you asked if we had a favorite or one piece spoke to us. Can we answer? Yes, every single one. Hard to pull one over the others. Well, that's kind of, I'm in that, I'm in that camp right there too. And I actually think that I like your, your last supper of capitalism better than the original one. What's his name? <laughs> oh, okay. Leonardo, but still, I like yours better. I think it's very powerful. When I saw that, I was like, yes. And there's another one. Every piece of art is noticed, and that art stays in the mind of the observer. Oh, and, I hope so. And, and oh, yeah, David Clyde to everyone. Uh, what are you working on now? What are you cur currently working on and what about the future? Um, so I'd like to keep doing the public art that I put on fences and around town. I think that's a nice way to connect with people, but I want to get, um, I want to keep doing the names of more species, but also get a little more messagey with it. So to include some of those sketches at the end and make those into finished drawings with messages that are a little more direct about saving, you know, doing some work to save the planet. <laughs> um, okay, well, as she says, she, she loves the public art project. Which oh, I think is really thanks. good. Yeah, I like, I like being able to put stuff out in the street because um, I, I feel like, having it in a enclosed space is a little intimidating and people don't often as much go there, but if they see it in their neighborhood, it's more random and fun and people could feel like they discovered something. Um, Laura said, I do love the pulling together of the labor, the labor environmental movements and recognizing that we are part of nature as well as causes of the problems and contributors to the solutions. That's and what is the medium of your take me home are the ones the ones where you have people take her take them home? Oh those are prints. So I do those on um, procreate they're digital drawings that I print out on kind of fancy art paper and so it's a nice print, but yeah, digital. And so people take them home? People take yeah, them? Yeah, they great. do, yeah. And, and sometimes they'll write to me on Instagram or share a photo or something. And I think that's really fun. I've only seen it happen once where it happened right after I left so I could watch somebody discover it, look at it and put it in their purse. So that was pretty cool. And how can people support Stephanie's work? Um, by doing whatever your work is to okay. fight for our, our planet. Uh, I think so, just all of us working together on that is the best. We're posting your website, Stephanie. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. that would be one, one way to support yeah. you. Yes. Uh, um, also, goodbye. yeah. Um, can you talk a little more about your technical processes and how they have changed with computerization? 
Yeah, um, the cartoons I used to draw uh, were all with pen on paper. And then I would scan them later on and try to, you know, clean them up. And I, the color I added on in Photoshop. Um, nowadays, I use Procreate for the illustrations, but I've gotten way more into also analog media. I really love using paint of different kinds, gouache, watercolor, acrylics, mixing that with um, color pencil, inks, you know, using a bunch of different medium on media on paper is where I have the most fun. But then if I'm trying to get something done, I'll use Procreate nowadays. And I just discovered a vector program that I really like, Affinity Designer too. And I'm working on um, the, I'm, I've been hired to draw designs for utility boxes around town. So they're gonna be wraps around the utility boxes and they're all collections of animals and plants local plants and animals with hearts and the whole collection will be called love is all around and it'll have I'll, i'm going to make a list of all the different species so people can walk around and try to identify them all and from the boxes and make prints of them afterward as well you sound very high tech right now <laughs> <laughs> um, there was uh, there were more here um might it be good to encourage people to photograph, post, and share the public pieces so people can go out to see them? So you could have, you know, people. That's a good idea. Sharing, more sharing, yes. Yeah, I'll definitely do, try to do that. What do we have? Oh, here's one. The cartoon of the activist being lured into a bird cage by money from a philanthropist reminded me so much of what is happening now with really big bucks coming into the climate fight. There are NGOs springing up out of nowhere, not democratic and transparent, but very well resourced. Many young activists are of course, looking for jobs. Stop yeah. Forward. Well, yes, um, this has been happening for a while and it's hard to even know. There, there were protests I've been to where I didn't know if they were real, you know, if they, if the people who were there actually believed in what they were saying or if it was just uh, paid work, you know. Um, I recall a time when activism was all just spontaneous, we weren't paid, no one was paid for that kind of thing. Um, it was all out of conviction. And then gradually it's become very, yeah, infused and, and with money and confusing as to where the motivations really are and what the agenda really is underlying it. So, you know, while I understand that people need work and want, and, and it's very tempting to want to say I can get paid for something I want to do anyway and that I that's going to do good in the world that's really great but you have to be so vigilant about what is actually being where you where are your energy is actually being um, taken to and I kind of recommend if you can do work political work on the side as well that's not paid you know feel the difference between that and the one at, at the job, you know, and really bring those skills that you learned at your job into political work that's not paid and just see what happens, you know, and, and how you feel about the two different strains um, because it's not the same exactly. So I, I think we have to be very careful to be paid for things like that. That's a good assignment you gave everybody just now. It's, but also, uh, uh, Marcus says, what an amazing installation. I think he's talking about these images. Oh, there. thank you. It is amazing. It's wonderful. Thanks. I really enjoy putting those out there. <laughs> I've gotten into a lot of really good conversations, you know, like debates on 
well, do mosquitoes have any purpose? And well, I don't like them. So, you know, that sort of thing. And, or someone very afraid of snakes, for example. And then it just opens up conversations. Um, let's see what we got. Actually, I think um, your paintings make me far more loving towards insects that I normally wouldn't have been that attracted to. The little snakes, the little worms, they're, they're so sweet. You, they're, I never thought they would be kissable insects or kisses. <laughs> <laughs> but you do that. And it translates into real life? No. <laughs> but I love the paintings. I love I'm them. I'm hoping it translates into real life. And when people see, <laughs> it's funny, um, I have a studio downtown and people come in sometimes. And um, the it's funny, but like certain people will just gravitate toward the pictures of the spiny orb weaver, the spider that looks really scary. And I have a few different artworks featuring them. And they just love those little things. And other people will just, um, you know, they hate them. They're afraid of them. They look scary. And uh, it's just, it opens up so many conversations about, you know, who really belongs here and how we should be um, treating the different, you know, life forms and the beings around us and how we should be, you know, interacting and how could we interact with them in a more mutually beneficial way. Uh, one more comment. Uh, you should all know about the Florida naturalist botanizer, writer, and photographer, Fran Palmieri, based in no Nokomis in Sarasota County. Her, her books look in, uh, is that right? Excuse me. Her books look inside, uh, her books include Florida uh, then and now. And I think she and Stephanie would make a great team in some creative ways. Oh, thank you for um, that recommendation. I just jotted her name down and I'll definitely look her up. And somebody said ecocentric. Guess so. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to wrap this up now. We have we could we could talk all day about how much we want to kiss bugs, but thank you so much for for this morning today, this yeah. day. Recording will be posted. And um, it's, re it's being recorded, and so it will be reposted. And well, thank you so much for having me here, and for everybody who's here watching. I really appreciate um, being able to share my work with you. You inspire us all. <laughs> <laughs>